right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. Welcome back from lunch, if you're rushing back from lunch. Um, we promise an engaging session. No post-lunch naps here. Um, there is nothing more exciting than talking about managing our employees, for sure. So I am a member of the um, Practical and Applied Management Committee with LAMA, um, and so I'm welcoming everyone today, so welcome. And this is the third so far of our series of chats that we're calling Practical Management or Practical Magic. And our goal with these chats is really just to create a space um, where it's very open and very low-key and very safe. Um, to discuss the really challenging parts of being a manager. Um, and so this particular topic that we picked today was talking about um, motivating employees and employee engagement. So we have two phenomenally talented library leaders here with us today who are going to talk through it. Um, so thanks for being with us, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and get us started. Okay, I'll go ahead and start. My name is Nayama Reed. I'm a library director at a suburban Milwaukee library, Whitefish Bay Public Library in Wisconsin. And I am also part of the LAMA Practical and Applied Management Group. And this will be my second time doing one of these conversations. And I'm looking forward to it today. And I'll turn it over to Kim to introduce herself. Thanks, Nayama. So I'm Kim Wolbeck. I'm the university librarian for the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, which has multiple campuses across the country, uh, Chicago and then also in Southern California and Washington, D.C. And I've been a librarian for about 20 years now and have supervised all levels of staff, starting with student workers, paraprofessional staff, as well as professional librarians. So we'll be talking a lot about that today. Um, I, I, I'll go ahead and do the chat recommendations. For those who have come in, we had these at the beginning because we delayed for a moment. But just to let you know, you're welcome to use an alias if you wanted to keep your identity secret due to some of the sensitive natures of the questions and postings. Also, all attendees coming in are muted, so only the panelists can be heard. Please ask questions in the chat window, but switch it to all participants. I believe the default is something different. And so then, like, the participants may see it, but the panelists won't. So if you switch it to all participants, then everyone can see it. We have a couple of other people with the LAMA group who are monitoring the chat so that if there's something um, apropos or extra to what we'll be discussing, then they will pass it on to Kim and I, but otherwise we'll be focused on the slides. So there's sort of multiple parts to this that are going on at the same time. Also, please maintain a collegial conversation in the chat window, even if you experience a frustrating difference of opinion. So let's get engaged here. So what? Let's start out by talking about what we mean when we talk about engagement. So I've done a lot of research in this area, and actually in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of work in the area of positive psychology and work engagement, and that's where this definition comes. So we all have our own personal definitions, and we know what we feel like when we're engaged, and that really relates to a positive, fulfilling, and work-related state of mind. So you come to work, you enjoy being there, but why? And that's a per couple of particular reasons. We all have certain demands from our jobs, um, starting with your job description, and then you come into work every day, you have your to-do list, your boss is telling you some things, you work with users, they're giving you other things to do. And so what kind of resources do you have to make sure that you yourself are engaged? And that is on two levels. So first are the job resources. And you can think about, I have an area to work, I have a computer to use, I have a pen to write with, but it goes beyond that as well. It, think about what your organization is like as a whole. Do you come to work every day and feel supported and positive in your work environment? Do you have a good relationship with your supervisor, with your library leadership? Uh, do they inspire you? Do they make it clear how your work fits into the overall goals of the library, the department, um, the area that you work in? Do you trust your teams, your supervisors, your coworkers as well? And that creates um, a good environment to work in. And then beyond that, do you feel 
capable? Do you feel like your workplace is preparing you to do your job successfully? And that includes training and ongoing development, uh, which in this time of, you know, ongoing budget cuts and kind of reorganizing departments and such, that can be a challenge. Um, so have you and your team discussed how you're going to continue your development? And as we could have a whole conversation about, do you feel fairly compensated for the work you do? And we're not just talking monetarily. Um, do you have such things as um, a good a schedule that works for your personal life, flexible scheduling? There's many more ways to be compensated other than monetarily. And this all contributes to a feeling of positive well-being in your workplace. And it also feeds into those personal resources that we all bring to our work and our physical environment every day. Uh, I know if you have a supportive work environment, that motivation you have to do a good job and be your best self uh, that comes from inside is really fed and grows um, given on your external environment. And do you feel up to the demands of your job? And that, again, comes back to have you been trained uh, properly? Do you feel supported? Do you have ongoing development? And also, you know, do you know where you fit within the organization? I think that goes a long way if you know what the plan of the organization is and how you fit into it and why your work is important. That is quite a motivator um, to make a person want to come into work every day, do the best job they can, and be really engaged. Okay. So research has also provided us with a model, which is a nice thing to have tacked up on your wall to remind you every once in a while, you know, what you're looking at, what you need. So this is called the Jobs, Demands, and Resources model, and um, this is done by Baker as well, um, who's done a lot of research in this area. And it's pretty self-explanatory, but what I want to point out are the two um, opposite uh, tenets of burnout and boredom. So you can know you can have a lot of demands of your job, but if you feel very supported, you're still going to be really engaged and challenged and you're going to want to do a good job. And then by the same token, um, you could have a lot of resources at your job, but maybe your job's not challenging enough or you outgrew it and your supervisor hasn't, you know, that hasn't been recognized. You haven't had that discussion with them. So, you could go either way. I, I don't. I think what we're looking for here is you want to be somewhere in um, the, the middle of this chart. Like you want to be engaged most of the time, but you know, given what's going on on a given day, you may be somewhere in the middle, which works as well. And I'll just pipe in there. Doing this um, helped me since recently we are juggling a ton of stuff at my library with. Um, hiring a new department head and things like that and looking at it going, oh, my demands are too high and my resources are too low. And reflecting back and having that conversation with my team leaders on are they getting enough resources? Do their teams then have enough resources to make sure nobody moves into the burnout, um, boredom or apathy area? And so as a manager, there is one key task that we can focus on here that's really important, although a lot of people think of it as time consuming, and that's the whole idea of coaching. And there's so much out there on life coaching, um, career coaching, different kinds of things. But what it boils down to is um, a couple of specifics. So it really, when you think about it in the workplace, it's a one-on-one -on -one activity. It's the supervisor and the employee and it involves planning. So three primary features of a coaching relationship are that it's systematic, there's a, a written out, agreed upon plan, it's organized, there are specific activities and conversations that will be had throughout the coaching sessions, and it's contextual. It's a conversation, coaching really is a conversation. Because 
you as a supervisor and your employee are agreeing upon what goals you both want to achieve out of this conversation. It is happening not in a vacuum, but within a specific context of the employee's work. So the three specific activities that are involved in this are directing the employee to specific activities, specific actions, um, specific ways of doing things, motivating, how do you motivate a person to do things in a different way if they've always done things one way and you're trying to enact change together. And then that constant feedback, which we all really like to hear. And so the key thing to know about this is this is not a quick fix. It's not a one and done conversation. It is an ongoing plan. And it may seem very time consuming, but the payoff is higher than you can ever imagine. If you're working with, this this works with all levels of employees. If you're working with a new librarian, it helps you get to know them, what their um, plan for their career is, and how you can help them achieve their goals as well as succeed and be the best person they can be in their role for you and help the organization succeed after, you know, um, as well. And then also on the flip side of that, when you're working with long-time employees who perhaps have done many different roles uh, within their library, and we'll touch on this a little bit later as well, um, making sure that they remain um, in tune to the needs of the organization, how their role fits into it, and keeping them learning and growing. And that really, at the end of the day, is what coaching is. Everybody benefits, everybody learns about each other, about the work that's being done, and everybody continues to grow. So to motivate and engage, I touched upon this a little bit, and actually most of these, but they all bear repeating um, consistently to remind you why you are doing this. So when you're sitting down and making a plan um, with a, an employee, um, and this could also be called, it's referred to sometimes in the literature as a performance improvement plan, and that often has a negative context for many of us. We have our once a year annual appraisal and then it gets shoved in a drawer and perhaps we don't look at it, but we all know that that's not how it's supposed to go. You work continuously throughout the year on your plan. And so an improvement plan is not just to correct negative behaviors or negative actions. It's to improve and build upon what is already being done that is wonderful or great, or maybe it's okay and you want it to get it to that wonderful level. So having a specific plan, and these are goals that you as the supervisor and your employee set together. Um, again, this is not done in a vacuum, and you need to meet in the middle somewhere. Um, you both have, as a supervisor and employee, you both have certain needs that need to be met, certain work that needs to be done, and you need to decide how to get there together, which feeds into our next thought where this is a collaboration. Uh, you are working together. It's not a competition. It's not I'm the boss and you need to do what I tell you what to do, where obviously there's going to be some of that in any role. Um, but there's more than one way to do any task. So thinking of it as a collaboration, how can we make things work more smoothly? How can we make things more efficient? Um, definitely working together and having regular conversations around a specific plan helps that. However, so I've said all this, but you may have certain um, uh, guidelines within your organization that may not allow you to do everything you would like to do to be as flexible as you would really love to be. Um, so you really have to tailor this to make sure that you're within the limits of your organization. So it may be, no, that person needs to be at the circulation desk eight hours. We need somebody there all the time. But is there anything that can be worked into that activity at the desk if that person can't go away uh, for training? Or can people be cross-trained? There's all sorts of different ways to think about um, 
trying to help somebody grow. Um, but keep in mind that you're working together um, as part of the organization to help ultimately improve the organization as well as the employee. Okay, so moving into the first question, people were able to submit questions online via link if they chose to, and so we pulled a few out for today. And the first one is, how does one motivate millennials with a lesser work ethic than others in the organization? And this one stood out to me. There are several different questions that came up that were generational related or millennial related. And I wanted to reflect back along with Kim on is this a millennial issue or is it just overall generational? I'm a Gen Xer and I remember coming in the exact same conversations about us. Or is it that we have someone new in the profession, they might be 30 versus 50, who are learning how to operate within a professional environment, and that's part of their learning curve, and talking with them about the culture of being on time and things like that. So, you know, looking at some of the research online today, um, I found that according to research, millennials like collaboration and knowing that their work is important and has an impact on the overall scheme of things. So talking with them about how we need you to still do, what, you know, ABC because this is your job, but then flexing how that is done to maybe meet what they are doing. And then explaining that it's important that you're here you know, on time or within five minutes, whatever is your library's culture for that particular thing, that that's part of the training process, not just how to check in books or how to catalog or how to be a librarian, but also how to be a professional working adult. And we've had that here at my library as a, a smaller public library. We get interns from the local library school and they come in with lots of ideas, which is great. We still need them to do what we need them to do. And part of it is teaching them over the course of the year of pick one idea and here's how to plan it, here's how to write it up, here's how to promote it, and that each idea takes a good three to six months to do so we can't implement all 12 ideas. And it becomes a learning process for them as they're growing. And that can still happen as a new librarian coming in with the master's degree if they haven't done it before. And that's part of our job as the more experienced librarians or managers is to help them learn that part. Um, so for me personally, I try not to think of millennials as having a lesser work ethic, but that they have different experience and they might have less experience and how to incorporate, incorporate that. And I know Kim has a lot of experience working with the students within her library. So how do you approach it, Kim? Um, I also want to say for those of you who may be in an environment where you employ student workers, um, I should say I've I've also worked with many new newbie librarians and have, you know, kind of not necessarily let them loose, but along the same lines that Nyama just pointed out, help them plan, help them figure out how to do it all, and then help them grow, and then they, you know, go, fly out into the world. And it's the same thing with your student workers, too. So where I work, we are actually a graduate school of psychology. So none of the student workers I have are going to be librarians, although we secretly wish that many of them would, but they still learn valuable skills. So you figure their main job is to be at the circulation desk. They may never check out another book again or help with a research request um, after they leave this library, but they are learning valuable customer service skills and we make sure they know that. And we actually build on the skills they come up with or come in with. Uh, we have some extremely creative students that come in with art backgrounds, with media backgrounds. And we have found that using the expertise they have, once we have that conversation and find out where their interests are, we now have amazing displays. We have amazing flyers. We come up with great ideas for our whiteboard that don't come from the librarians, all of that comes from the students. So they own their work and they realize, they see the results of their ideas come to fruition when, when other students, their, their colleagues come in and we can't keep books on a display because it's such a good display. The students picked out all the books and their colleagues are checking out all the books so they have to find more. So not only does it help them get um, 
to build their library skills using the catalog, working with our collection, but they see that they are making people happy. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll pipe in there too and mention this Office Ninjas link that I have here I found as I was looking for things for this. And it is a little bit more of a mass market, not research based um, type of article, but it, it I found it to be a good tone to it and talking about how there's positives to each of the generations and what could take place, whether formally or informally, is almost like a mentorship within taking the boomers and reflecting, or even the Gen Xers, and reflecting back, you have so much experience that's vital that can help the newer staff coming on. And then, you know, and then also these new staff have so many great ideas. Can you help them take one of these great ideas and teach them how to turn it into a program over the course of the year so that they're then working together and learning how they're each able to input something positive? There we go. Oops, did I miss a page? Nope. Okay. Okay. All right. So questions two through four. Um, this one here, they're, they kind of fit along a similar um, feeling for what they were asking. Nurturing employee growth when a good employee does not have desirability to move up. How do you inspire people who seem disinterested in their work even though they are fully capable? how to balance respecting staff who just want to work and go home, and your role to introduce change and provide excellent customer service. And so moving into this, you know, it gets to the core of engagement and motivation. Um, for me, one of the big things, as Kim mentioned a little bit earlier, is time. And as managers, a lot of us are extremely busy, and it can be hard to take the time to engage someone. But if we can't take the time to engage them, then we're shorting ourselves in them. That that's, that's really is what is needed. So why should they engage if we don't have the time for them? Um, and one of the things that's important in my experience is it can take weeks, months, years for an employee to become disengaged or maybe even bitter and burnt out. And it's not something that'll be fixed in a 10 minute, you know, fix it or you're fired type of conversation that it takes the time to sit with them. Um, and I just had a bit of an aha moment this week because I'm juggling so much and I had to interact with a staff member about something and I didn't take the time and unfortunately it, what I intended did not come across and she felt I was checking her off my list. So the next day I had to take a deep breath and refocus and it ended up being a 10 minute conversation but it went much better. And so I recommend as you're going to do this, realizing that you are investing the time in your employee to which then also invest time in the library and it's running and that this is a good return on investment for your library, even when you feel like you don't have that there. What I like to do when I started at my current situation um, four years ago was I met with every single staff member, um, even the high school shelvers, and asked how they got here what they thought was going well and what they would change. And now, four and a half years into it, as we're having some changing, we're bringing in a new head of circulation, which is a big sea change, now's a good time to sit for me to sit down with each one of them again and have that conversation again. And it'll take me three weeks to meet with everybody, but it'll get a chance to see, have we settled into some ruts, with the, some ruts that I created? Um, were there ruts for them before I got here, before you took over their supervisor, some things they're still upset about, a promotion they didn't get? Or maybe they came in initially with a ton of great ideas and they had someone who didn't have the time or the inclination to nurture those ideas, so they shut down. And now you're coming back and saying, oh no, it's a new show, and you know, let's do all this great stuff. It'll take some time for them to trust that what you're saying to them as their supervisor is true. And so taking that time to go through with them and find out what's going on with them that has gotten them to this place of disengagement and showing that you do really care about them as, an, as a person, not just as an employee. And a couple things that Kim and I talked about as we were prepping for this is also culture versus job description. So as we're looking at motivating employees, one thing to consider is are they doing their job? Are they fitting the job description? Not everyone is a star employee. And those of us who end up in management typically are go-getters, um, maybe type A's or people who just like to do a lot of different things and we enjoy it. And so we're constantly looking to improve and we then 
good or bad, judge other people based on that? And do we, is it acceptable for other people in the organization to come in and clock in and go home? And, you know, and so they're maybe neutral, they're not negative and being dysfunctional, but they're not a star and they don't want to be a star. So my question back to you as the supervisors in these situations is, can you and your organization accept someone who's happy to do their job and clock out? And if not, then the next thing, you know, to get into is, are they meeting their, the basics of their job description? If they are, then perhaps the job description is no longer sufficient for what it is you need, and you need to update that job description and have a new meeting of these are the new expectations going forward and what we need you to live up to. Um, and how do you balance those two different things? Do you expect someone to give 110% all the time? And can you enforce that if it's not official? So who, if you're a middle manager, who above you, are they gonna back you up? So if you're trying to do all this stuff to motivate and engage, and I've, we've all had bad employees, we've all had bad supervisors, I've had some where it, if there was no stick, this person was not gonna change. And unfortunately, upper management would not do anything in the end run. So you couldn't motivate him because there was no chance of him being fired or let go and stuff. So you need to think about this before you sit down with them of what is your full aspect of your toolkit to talk with them, starting with the motivating, moving into coaching, moving into corrective action if they're not meeting the job description, if it's appropriate for what they're currently doing. Um, and if not, is there the potential for writing them up or doing something? And if not, you may have to accept where they're at and work within that. And which I just wanted to bring it up because it's not always the, the answer that we want to hear, but we also have no magic wands and stuff. So um, so hopefully your upper management backs you up in what you're trying to do. Questions five and six. Um, these ones were kind of like taking all of these different things that we have talked about. Um, I have several staff members who are not motivated. They seem to only want to show up and leave. This is frustrating when we need to create joint goals in the library unit. And some people are not invested. Contributing factors are age, near retirement or millennial, personality, years of indifferent leadership in which behavior was accepted and ignored. Um, another one, how to motivate someone who's experienced, middle-aged, and trapped in a middle management position. They've moved as far as they can. Um, speed reading through, they may feel threatened by the younger people coming up, and so they don't want to train them to take over for them and stuff. So, Kim, how would you deal with something like this in your organization? Yeah, with um, an employee who has been here a while, and um, I've experienced a lot of change in the organizations I've been in. So one of the things that I thought about reading this question is organizational memory. So those people who have been able to be in a place for a long time, they have a lot of skills and teaching that they might not even realize. So say if they're near retirement, perhaps, they've been in an organization maybe even just five years, um, and everybody else is under that um, time limit. I think that's a really good um, training and learning opportunity, and you could do it very informally. Um, one idea that struck me is having things such as lunch and learns and say, today we're going to focus on circulation desk policies and, you know, how they evolved. So the person that's been here for a while can sort of give the history of what used to be done, why things changed from their viewpoint and how things have worked. And uh, that would be a good start to a conversation. Well, have we ever tried this? Have we done this? And this person may have some insight into uh, previous um, things that have been tried. In fact, um, as Nayama and I have been talking about this, it makes me think uh, we've had the same situation here um, organizationally because we've had, you know, a fair amount of turnover in the last few years, so people come in with these great ideas. And I said, well, yeah, we've tried that about five years ago, but you know what? It's a different time now, so let's give it another shot. And so that would be a refresher for the organization. Maybe things that didn't work once will work now. And it's because of the suggestion of the person that's been here um, a long time. Maybe they don't feel 
as valued in their work because they know their job so well. So where can you challenge them um, by helping others? And it's the same token when you have a newer employee, too, that comes in with all the ideas and you're working hard to harness that energy, but perhaps um, pairing them with a, a longer-term employee, forming a mentoring relationship. It doesn't have to be necessarily be you as a supervisor, um, but perhaps pairing together that near retirement employee and that brand new employee, so then not only are, is the newer employee being mentored, but organizational knowledge is also being passed along and may not be as easily lost. So that's um, a pretty good way to approach this type of situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I'll mention that um, in the further down, we have a slide of re recommended resources, the things that we've used for developing this um, webinar discussion here. And the one I like is called Coaching for Improved Work P Performance by Fornice. Um, it was written in 2000, but it's still very um, good to use. And I got in there. It's a whole chapter on motivation. And it talks about that in research, the number one thing they have found that motivates people is actual achievement. And number two is recognition. And one of the uh, recommended things for you as the manager to do is to sit down, whether with the specific employee or all your employees, and think, okay, in the last week, in the last month, in the last three months, whatever is your frame of reference, what successes has and achievements has this person or this department had? And write them all down, big or small, and then think, okay, in that same time frame, how many times did I say, good job, excellent, that really helped the department run more efficiently? And what the research has shown is it tends to be about one to four, that for every four achievements, there's a good job. And are you giving enough good jobs? Is it possible to give even more, even recognizing the small things? And that starts to build the person up to give them some of that internal recognition and motivation that my boss appreciates me and realizes what a good job I'm doing to then build the, the foundation to do some more motivation with that person. Um, the other thing that's really important is to um, make it very descriptive. So not just, hey, great job, but that was a really good job dealing with that upset patron. I realized they were coming in and looking for a fight and you maintained your calm demeanor and by the time it was over, the person had calmed down. What can I do for you to help you release the stress that came on? Do you need to step back in the back room for a moment and I'll take over the desk? Um, so making it specific so they know what's doing well. And then if, if something wasn't perfect, you know, this could have been a little better next time, but again, keeping it specific. So, and one of the things in the book they mentioned was to take all of your direct reports, whether it's two or eight, and write it on your calendar, and each day circle, did I give them a, a compliment today? Did I say that was a good job and tell them what it was for? So you can see after a week or a month, how many times are you complimenting Nancy versus Todd? Um, and it's getting enough. And for me too, and I've mentioned this in the previous webinar, one of the things I do in personal life and work life is if someone's being frustrating or lazy, is to turn it around for myself and say, how is Bob not lazy? How is Bob productive? And maybe Bob is the one who's doing all those little things in the background that I don't see, and it's not the specific goal I'm looking for. But if I were to go to him and say he's not being productive, he knows all that stuff. And to force myself to flip it so I can look what, at what it is that Bob is doing. So then when I meet with him, I can say, Bob, I noticed that you know, you do a great job. You spend two hours a day going through all the damaged materials that come in, and they can be gross and dirty with bugs and mold, and that's really important for keeping our shelves in good shape. And now we need to work on this other goal, too, um, and stuff. So that's the way I, I make it more personal and, and positive for them when I'm talking to them, so they're not only getting dinged. No one likes to only get dinged and stuff. And I have found over my time here in four years that – Having that open communication where I talk with everyone, so when there is an issue, it's not just the negative, it's the positive too. How is your day? How is the book processing going? It, it ends up making a difference in the long run. And to add to that, um, sometimes you may get to the point of corrective action before you mm -hmm. have your aha moment. A particular story I'd like to share with that would 
was quite a few years ago with a student worker who was a good employee, but as Nayamo was saying, he came across to me as lazy and not really motivated when he came in. And I knew he was pursuing a doctoral degree, but I wasn't sure of you know all the limitations he had. So finally, I had had it. Um, even after you know giving him some projects and trying to get him to do different things, it just wasn't working. And so it turned out that I wasn't motivating him in uh, a most positive way, and it was all coming across negative. So we sat down for the corrective action talk. And we had a very frank and open conversation, and he let me know that how much he did care about this work, and I discovered how detail-oriented he was, the things I wasn't seeing. And he ended up being one of our most valuable employees, and we all cried, actually, when he graduated. <laughs> we did not want to see him go, but he left quite a legacy behind him, and we still... Mm -hmm mention his name occasionally. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I like that story. Um, from the chat room, are there any additional questions for what we've talked about or in addition be above and beyond what we've talked about that, that we can address? Uh, this is Mary, and nope, nothing yet has come in, but um, I also want to remind participants that we're also mm -hmm. over on Twitter, um, hashtag Lama chat. L L A M A C H A T. So, um, that's okay. another option to participate if anybody feels like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Nayama. You're welcome. And we have here, I believe, what we've done with the previous ones is with this re recording, it'll be put up online, and then we have the links here to the couple of resources that we used um, for developing this, both online and then the book I talked about. And then there's also a Google form link for a quick, I think it's three or four question survey of how this went and then giving feedback about possible discussion topics for future chats. Okay, it looks like that's the last slide. All right. Okay, um, Any anything coming in last minute? Not yet, so and do any of our attendees have any comments or questions? Um, I, as a millennial myself, I was really interested mm -hmm. in the millennial question, so I'm mm -hmm. just curious maybe how that question resonated with people, uh, maybe beyond the um, mm -hmm. explanations that Nayama and Kim provided. And I'll throw out there, it hit me too, because one of my friends on Facebook, who is a colleague I've worked with, mentioned she's a millennial, and the upper end of millennials now are 38. Um, wow. So they're not the youngins. Uh, right. and, and there's there's some in there who there are already assistant directors and, and directors and stuff. So, um, yeah. And I'm wondering too. You know, my first thought was, well, maybe <laughs> is it even a is it even a work ethic issue? Maybe it's somebody who just works differently. You know, like right. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're working at night after mm -hmm. you know picking something up in the evening or working on the mm -hmm. weekends. So I think really having those conversations yeah. about how people prefer to work um, can even be really illuminating. Okay. I just saw a question pop up um, from someone saying, how do you motivate student workers when there is high turnover? I'll, I'll turn that over to Kim. <laughs> well, it's not easy. Um, mm -hmm. And we've tried a number of different things here from having an employee of the month to having competitions, especially mm -hmm. when we instituted um, marking our reference statistics. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found the most motivating is really having that conversation with your student workers and finding what they what their outside interests are outside of school mm -hmm. so a reference again to all the creative artistic um, people we've had or perhaps you have somebody that is really good organizationally and it details in fact mm -hmm. i have two people on my student staff right now who are extremely creative and we've basically put them in charge of um, displays and um, flyers and mm -hmm. then i have a couple other um, students who are extremely detail oriented and there's a huge reorganization project we're doing with one of our collections right now. And I said, you know what, we will talk about this, but I want you to come up with a plan 
and tell me what it is. We'll discuss the pros and cons. And so we we worked through all that. We had an organization mm-hmm. plan, and we're halfway through with the organization, and she's leading the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I she comes in. She jumps right into it. She's mm-hmm. highly motivated. So I found that meeting the students where they are also Mm -hmm. in terms of not only what their skills are, but what their limitations are. Mm -hmm. Um, We find, yes, around finals time, we have to remind people, don't forget, we know you have finals. Because you have to study for a final is not an excuse to call in sick to work. So Mm -hmm. plan ahead. So we have high expectations and we will be as flexible with you as we can, but we also Mm -hmm. expect that flexibility from you. Mm -hmm. So Make sure you're planning ahead. If Mm -hmm. you can fill in for somebody else, please do that. Um, We actually have a group email that everybody can um, talk on. We've tried different things and have used our students as focus groups, such as online training Mm -hmm. for graduate assistants. Um, When we reorganize the library website, our students serve as a focus group. Uh, so really involving them in mm-hmm. as much of the operations of the library as we can um, mm-hmm. and giving them ownership when we can. And that's mm-hmm. been really successful, um, mm-hmm. so much so that I'd say for at least five years now, I've had department chairs um, comment on the student staff of the library and say it's the best student staff on campus, um, mm-hmm. very helpful, very informed. And I think what is also helped too, which I think so many of us have, is a very specific training program. And then if you have somebody that can touch base with the students on a regular basis um, and getting to know them as well. We have also have, we don't necessarily go out and do social things, but we'll have sort of social moments here Mm -hmm. on campus. Um, Throughout the semester, our Spring and summer semester is really tough because we don't get a spring break. So we have evolved into having mini breaks, say, on Fridays. Say, okay, we're going to kind of let loose a little bit and have some fun conversations and just be ourselves Mm -hmm. and share those, you know, cute cat pictures or help somebody apartment hunt. So we'll allow Mm -hmm. time for that. And then everybody will go back and, Mm -hmm. you know, they know what they need to do and they'll do it. Mm -hmm. So... This is a couple things that we've tried here too, but yeah, that is one of the constant battles I think you have. Yeah, for for us here, we have a we have like six or seven high school age shelters ranging from 14 to 18. Certainly, there's a lot more training going on for the 14 year olds who have never worked before, and we usually have two library school interns where they're currently enrolled, um, and those can really vary between people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, up into their 50s if they're going back. And for for each, I try to approach it, and with my department has approached it as we realize they're not going to be here long term. We need them to do this job, but what can we do to help them, particularly the ones who are in library school? You know, you want in the future want to be a teen librarian. What do the teen librarians' job postings say you need experience in? And then we'll figure out how to give you projects so that you get that experience in addition to doing what we're doing here so that it, it really shapes them as they get out into the marketplace in a year or two. Pretty much all of our interns end up with full-time jobs, um, even if it might take a few months, because we really, really try to mentor them to, you know, make it worth their while. And even the high school ones recently, um, as my head of circulation retired, I realized she did all the training and all the manuals were in her head. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And so I actually sat down with the shelvers and asked them, did you feel fully trained? What is working? What isn't working? What I reflected back to earlier, what I did initially, and these are all new trainers or shelvers in the last year because they turn over a lot. Um, and some of them are really good, and we can. And then I ask them to document things, so when the new head comes in in a month, we can sit down as a team and come up with that training manual and feedback from them on what's working and isn't. So even though they're 16 or 17, they have some ownership, and we can explain to them as you're applying to college, you're applying for another job, you can list us as a reference because we'll have worked with you. And so. It's not just coming in and making minimum wage for five hours a week. It can still lead to more, and it gives them a sense of ownership. We found that useful. Now, I saw some questions popping up in the corner, and with my share screen, I can't go back and see them. So could you read one of them back to us? Sure. So this is Mary. Um, We Mm -hmm. had another question come in through the Q&A. 
um, that mm -hmm. I think is a really good one, so I'm glad somebody asked it. If one employee sees another employee that may be perceived as slacking, but they are mm -hmm. really coping with some personal problems, how do you mm -hmm. maintain confidentiality while trying to explain to the employee who is complaining about the quote-unquote slacker? That's a tough balance. It, it is. In the coaching class I had earlier this year where I learned about this book that I mentioned, um, they mentioned that it's fair to say to someone that, you know, you as the manager are working with the employee and it's nobody else's business. Mm. You know, and, and reflect that that may seem frustrating, but that you are dealing with it. And hopefully as your manager, you know, if you have that trust relationship, they'll leave it at that. But, yeah, we just, we can't say anything like, oh, it's personal. You know, that still gives away that something's going on mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and stuff. So, and hopefully with time, you know, they'll if they have something, they'll realize, or maybe the staff member, if they're comfortable, they'll bring up what's going on with the staff. But it is, and I'll reflect back to staff, you know, as a manager, I, I just can't tell you, you know, because of confidentiality. And just as you would want me to be confidential about, you know, your employment and things going on, I need to be confidential for other people and stuff and reflect it back on that. And that they, they may not give them the answer they want, but unfortunately, it's the, you know, getting down to the legal part of being a boss, um, it, it kind of cuts it and stuff. I think the harder one is when you see people slacking and, staff, and management doesn't deal with it. Right. And yeah. I've also seen, again, this is Mary again, I'm just jumping into, I've also mm -hmm. seen where, you know, I, I, I've learned a long time ago, like, we have no idea the mm -hmm. conversations that employees and supervisors have and the arrangements mm -hmm. they make with each other. You know, it could be that that mm -hmm. person, maybe they are taking some time off for doctor's appointments or something, but maybe they're making mm -hmm. that time up in the evenings or the weekends or working mm -hmm. from home. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, we really have no way of knowing. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's tempting to make those snap judgments if you see somebody, like, coming in maybe 15, 20 minutes late every mm -hmm. day. Um, but we really have no way of knowing what arrangement they have with their supervisors. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it would be fair to then reflect back to the person who's commenting or asking, you know, it sounds like you're concerned about the staff member or their workflow. Mm -hmm. How is that impacting you? Yeah, So then right. see, are they having to pick up more? And is right. there something you can then do to ameliorate their system? You know, so is there something that, like it's affecting them versus just that they're bitter or they're mm -hmm. got to be, you know, there can That's be really different levels. Point. You know, I've had coworkers before where we knew if you wanted everyone to know something, you told so-and-so. Um, and as the manager, then <laughs> you decide what you want to tell them or you let them know, you know, we're not, we can't gossip about this or we can't talk about this. But I would turn it into a reflection for them of what's, what's how is this impacting you and how can mm -hmm. I help you, mm -hmm. you know, at, just as I work with other people. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I don't have anything to add to that. Yeah. <laughs> we had um, a, this is this is a great question. I love I love brainstorming stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asked, what ideas do people have on different like ways to recognize people? And he and the mm -hmm. person said, realizing that people have different preferences. Um, mm -hmm. We're thinking of a good old fashioned bulletin board of kudos. Um, mm -hmm. But how what other like techniques have people used to recognize their mm -hmm. employees? And somebody shared um, a link and Twitter and on the chat. So there's one mm -hmm. um, Google site to look at as an example. I even just got um, post-it notes so I can write, thanks, Jean, for something and stick it on the wall so everyone can see it and put them out for the other employees to do it too. So it's not just coming from me. It's coming from the colleagues too, and it's sort of a quick – you know, feel good thing. I actually got that from someone I knew who worked at Target. They actually, Target has pre-printed like kudos slips they get, and you're expected to give so many to your coworkers. Uh, <laughs> Every oh. shift, like he got dinged for not writing enough uh, kudos. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and stuff. Here at our library, um, being a smaller suburban library, we do a lot of potlucks. Uh, maybe every other month. Monthly, we buy a gigantic chocolate chip cookie and we put a list with everybody's name. Um, I just bought logoed bags for everyone um, mm. with some staff support money from our friends group. Um, and it's ones we're not even selling to the public, you know, so it's very specifically theirs um, and stuff. So some little things like that. And then we try to have here flexibility. So if you need to go, you know, do this, and it's in the middle of your shift and we have the desk coverage, then I'm, I'm maybe more laissez-faire than some, but I say, you know, okay, go ahead and do that and make your time, send me an email so we can track it. 
Um, so, because we realize here in our community, almost all of our CERC employees are 10 hours a week, local, stay-at-home moms, their kids have gotten old enough um, that they're in school and they're looking for something to do. And what they love about this job and why they stay here and they're happy is because we give them that flexibility. As long as they find someone to cover their shift, they can do whatever it is they need to do. So it's sort of the soft payback without money. And I even think, too, um, we always used to joke, like when I was younger, my colleagues and I used to joke, but if we ever got into a leadership position, mm -hmm. we wanted to be, be the boss who brings the donuts. You know, yeah. The, yeah. like yeah. the boss who, like, I think even randomly showing up with, mm -hmm. you know, a box of donuts or it, mm -hmm. you know, snacks of some kind or uh, some other type of small recognition, mm -hmm. just randomly, not even for um, any right. particular occasion. It's just a really nice way to recognize, like, to all of your staff, I see you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. And yeah. even I had a boss before that would do actual handwritten thank you cards when you did a big program. You know, um, you know, you did a great job with so and so on this program. Thank you very much, and all you do, um, and stuff. And that was real nice. Awesome. Yeah, I have yeah. to say, I'm the boss that brings the donuts. Um, <laughs> I love and that. And one of one of the things um, too that if your organization has a newsletter, whether it's internal or external. Um, Say it's monthly. We have um, monthly or biweekly newsletters here, and give it a shout out to mm -hmm. somebody who's done a good a good thing. So people who might not know that name, they'll come and ask you. I'm like, oh yeah, let me introduce you to so and so, mm -hmm. and then that gets that person some recognition outside of the library, mm -hmm. and then people will come to them. I've also referred students to students. Um, going back to the other. Um, the conversation about students with artistic ability who do our displays. Uh, this gentleman is so skilled, and I had another student who is from our Student Government Association come up to me and say, who did that? That is amazing. So I said, oh, he's right here. Let me introduce him. And so now they're connected, and they've got our design guy um, doing some design things for the student government. So he is branching out. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think definitely the shout out that comes on a larger level. Mm -hmm. um, so other people outside of who they work, your employee works with on a direct basis, um, sees that name out there and then recognizes it the next time it comes up in conversation mm -hmm. um, is really valuable. It makes people feel really good about the job they're doing and then they know they've been seen and that you're paying attention to them. Great. So I'm just looking through, um, looking through the chats. I don't see any other questions come in. Okay. Um, yeah. So other, uh, there is um, the link that we shared was for a website that talks about something called an affirmation station, which I love. Um, I do. Oh, love that. I want to try okay. that. Yeah. It looks like a really great idea. Um, but yeah. So I think if you all don't have anything else to share, we can go ahead and wrap this up. Um, Excellent. Yeah, so I just want to thank Nayama and Kim mm -hmm. for being here today for leading this discussion. I'd like to thank the participants for all their great ideas, their great questions. Um, mm -hmm. Nayama, do you want to pull up the uh, or do you want to pull up the slide with the survey? Um, I have. I should have it up right now. Yes. So it has the QR code and then the Google Form link. Perfect. Oh, yeah. um, you might be able to cut. No, because it's PowerPoint, you can't copy and paste it. Unfortunately. Um, could you copy and paste that into the chat? Or actually, I could probably I could pull that up from the file you sent us. If you could, yeah, because because I'm sharing yeah. my screen, I can't see the yeah, chat. Yeah, perfect. And All I right. don't know I how to exit this without logging out. So let me pull this up. So everybody who's still attending, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to put up a link for a quick, quick, mm -hmm. quick survey. And I promise Great. this. Tiffany helps. just got it. Oh, good. Thanks, okay. Tiffany. Mm -hmm. um, this really helps us. We uh, There's a whole committee of us who plan these talks, and we want them to be useful mm -hmm. more than anything. Um, mm -hmm. We realize pretty quickly that these chats are filling a real need in our community. Um, so mm -hmm. we really do listen to your feedback and take it very seriously, and it will help us plan our um, future chats in this series. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, everybody. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks, yeah, thank everybody. You.